Hey guys, Kevin here. I wanted to share with you a new development with the podcast. It is coming to you from a new podcast hosting service, Anchor.fm. So far, I'm really impressed. I really like it. Uh, Number one, it's free, which is always great. It's also integrated with Spotify and offers some great analytics on who's listening. Helps me gain some insight into what content would be good for the audience. And you can also record from your phone which is a nice new feature that I'm using right now. So if you have a podcast or you're interested in starting one, download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. The You Can't Make This Up History Podcast Bringing you strange but true things from the past It's not the average history that you learned in school We're bringing you the heroes and bringing you the fools Them stories that are just too Boyd and Beth Morrison, uh, thank you both so much for coming on to the podcast today. Thank you for having us. So great to be here, Kevin. Thanks for having us today. Really excited to talk about our book. Yeah. So uh, where are you folks joining me from today? I see I see you're in I, locations. Yes, I am in Seattle. And I'm in Los Angeles. Okay. And you two are siblings, correct? Indeed. Yes, I'm the older brother. <laughs> he gets to have that role his whole life, no matter what I do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so you are a uh, brother-sister duo who have a book coming out. Uh, you have uh, written a novel uh, called The Lawless Land. Uh, so tell me a little bit about your backgrounds, because they seem to work very well together for writing historical fiction. Um, I am a thriller novelist. I have 12 books under my belt up till this point. Um, six of them that I co-wrote with uh, Clive Cussler in the Oregon Files series. And um, they're all contemporary thrillers. So The Lawless Land is my first foray into a historical thriller. And when I decided to undertake that, I thought, well, I have the perfect co-writer to undertake this with, and that is my sister, Beth. Yeah, so I also am a a writer and have um, a number of books under my belt, but this is my first fiction Um, endeavor because I am a medieval art historian. So I've written a number of scholarly books about medieval art history, but really jumped at the opportunity to um, work on a a fictional work uh, for the first time. So when Boyd asked me to join him as a team in writing something about the Middle Ages, I was all over it. Okay, and so I'll ask you uh, both uh, a a little something uh, about your careers before your team up. Um, uh, Boyd, uh, you know, how did you end up, uh, you know, writing with Clive Cussler? And did you have to do a lot of scuba diving for that? I am a certified scuba diver before (laughs) I ever started writing with Clive. Um, I, I started my career in engineering. I have a PhD in industrial engineering, which is not a typical path for a thriller novelist. Um, but I, decided I also to have with... a degree in engineering that is collecting dust and not being used. So. <laughs> yes, we, well, congratulations. <laughs> my parents are so proud. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it, I think engineering, as, as you might agree, is a good starting point for other careers. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, uh, so I started writing novels. I wrote six novels and it was around that time that Clive Custer was looking for a co-author on the Oregon series. And he called me up out of the blue and asked me if I wanted to start writing them with him. And I said, that would be fantastic. And, and the reason he found me is because he read a couple of my previous books and, and felt uh, I would be a great fit for his style. And, and that's not surprising because I grew up reading his books. And so I was, mm-hmm. my, my own writing style was heavily influenced by his. Um, so, so, 
yeah, I, I, I love doing adventurous things. I love writing fun, fast paced, action packed stories. And so I just dove right in to, to writing those. And um, I, I wanted to do, have the same kind of experience with a historical thriller, the same fast pace and tons of action and exciting characters. And so when I, when I thought of doing a historical book, it was funny because I was thinking of, well, I, I know World War II pretty well. And I thought, well, what else could I do? And, and my wife said, well, you have a built-in co-writer. And I said, well, who's that? She said, uh, your sister, Beth, who is a world expert on the Middle Ages. And I said, <laughs> oh, yeah, that makes sense. And so I called her up and uh, said, what would you think about writing a book with me uh, about um, a medieval thriller? And she luckily said, yeah, I'm all on board. And it was great because she has edited all of my other books. So she knows my writing style very well. She loves thriller novels. And so it was just a great fit. Uh, is she a brutal editor? <laughs> no, she's, she's very, uh, she's very kind, um, <laughs> but she's honest. And that's what I want is somebody who's going to really tell me something isn't working. Um, and so, because I, I want to get the best read for my my readers out there and so she will tell me if something isn't working um but not in a brutal way <laughs> she she will give me the 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 honest truth but um she delivers it in a very diplomatic way well and i think that's where the sibling relationship helps so much because boyd and i have always been really good friends ever since we were little and i think that kind of shared background and the kind of trust that builds up over 50 years uh, between siblings really helps out when we're trying to write something because we we know each other so well we know our thought processes and so when you know I say boy this just isn't working or when he says to me Beth that's not gonna happen you know we, we take each other seriously but we do it in a way that is totally based on on you know mutual respect and and trust and I think that's what makes the writing relationship so great. And we have a lot of fun with it. This is just, we wanted to have a, a fun experience. And part of that was traveling to do the research for this. We've traveled many times before together. And so we, we spent uh, 10 days in England, France, and Italy following the path that our characters follow in the story. And, and it was just a blast doing that research together. Now, uh, Beth, you, I think, have the job that a lot of historians that go into grad school dream they could have. Uh, you get to work with medieval manuscripts and illuminated copies. Um, how did you get into that? And, and, and what's your research focus? So I always tell people, and I firmly believe it, I have the best job in the world. Um, I get to... Um, you know, deal with medieval manuscripts every day of my life, which really is a dream come true. I was so fortunate cool. enough. Yeah, it, it, it's totally cool. <laughs> <laughs> I won't deny it. <laughs> um, I was really lucky in that um, uh, Boyd and I went to a very good high school and they actually offered art history of all things. And so when I was 15 years old, I, you know, we started with cave paintings and when we got to the middle ages, I just stopped and, and never moved. So since I was 15, I knew I wanted a job in medieval manuscripts and due to, I would say a lot of hard work, but also just a lot of luck and being in the right place at the right time and proving myself. Um, I am now senior curator of manuscripts at the J. Paul Getty Museum in Los Angeles. And I encourage everyone out there to come see our manuscripts exhibitions because they are fabulous and interesting. And it's an art form you're not really gonna run into in any other uh, museum on a regular basis. So please come. Okay, so you have the, you know, you've realized you have the, the, the fictional writing uh, talent and then the, the historical know-how. And so you decided to team up for this book, The Lawless Land. 
Um, whoever wants to take this one, you know, what's kind of your uh, elevator pitch for what your novel is about? Well, it's a uh, thriller that takes place in the 14th century in the immediate aftermath of the worst of the Black Plague. And it also takes place during the Hundred Years War between France and England. And it's about a wandering knight who has been stripped of his property and reputation, and he is on a quest to regain it. And during this quest, he comes across a noblewoman who is fleeing her, her evil fiance. And he uh, comes to her rescue and they set off on a journey together that involves a um, brutal uh, sociopath who's helping this, this uh, fiance who's after her and he is an Earl in England. And they have teamed up with a Cardinal who has designs on the papacy. And they are all after this couple because they possess an object which could change the balance of power in, in the papacy. And so this <clears throat> cardinal thinks that if he gets his hands on it, that will make him pope. And so they are all after this priceless object and it's an epic journey across England, France, and Italy to get this object to safety. And you won't be surprised that an art object is at the center of the story. <laughs> that was one of my conditions <laughs> of writing the novel because I'm currently working actually on an academic book that's a survey of 14th century French manuscript illumination. And that was one of the things that was really helpful about setting the book in 1351 is that we have all kinds of art resources for what people look like, hairstyles, outfits, you know, what architecture looked like. And that's really been integrated into the fabric of the novel all the way along, which was sort of one of my main roles, but a delightful role. And I think it's not much of a spoiler to say that a manuscript is at the center of this <laughs> chase. Yeah, it's super exciting. I never thought when I was um, getting my PhD that that all that kind of information that I studied would come in so handy in terms of fiction. <laughs> Of course, though, I mean, you can set this in, in, in such a context that it becomes, you know, really exciting. I mean, you know, we as history people get excited about, you know, 14th century manuscripts regardless, but even the general public can really get excited and intrigued by these things when you put it in a, in a fictional setting. Yeah, I really feel like this is an extension of my work at the Getty because what my job is as an art historian is to share my excitement about medieval manuscripts and why they're so culturally important with audiences. And, and this is simply a different way of doing that. And, you know, if it gets people excited and if they, you know, they read the book and they're like, oh, what, what's a curdle or what is, what does she mean when she's talking about a crenellation or embrasure or something? And they go to Wikipedia to look it up. And then, as you know, you get lost in the internet and you keep researching and researching. I really hope that that will be part of the impact of the book. So what was your process for writing this? You already mentioned you did some traveling, you, you know, you went to France, you went to England. Um, how did you, you know, divvy up responsibilities? Um, and, you know, how did you go about writing this book? Well, um, we, we plot out the book together, you know, luckily with modern technology, even though we're in different cities, we can communicate by email, text, phone, Zoom. And um, so we spend, a, we talk together almost every day. And we, when we're walking our dogs, uh, we, we do a lot of our plotting together. And, um, and also Beth lives in LA, so she gets a lot of traffic time where she has nothing else to do <laughs> than talk to me. Um, so we plot out the book together. And once we have the scenes set, um, I take a stab at writing a first draft of each scene. And then I send them to her as we're going. And she uh, corrects all of my <laughs> medieval anachronisms that I don't know, because I never would have undertook this kind of novel without her expertise, because if, if, she, if she doesn't know it, which is infrequently, she knows who will know it. 
Um, and so she, she edits the book or edits the scene, corrects all or adds the period detail and sends it back to me. And then we just keep going like that till the book's done. Yeah, it really is a, a, a big back and forth process. And like Boyd said, without the advent of cell phones and unlimited minutes, there is no way we could have done this book. So I think it's really ironic that it was really 21st century technology that made possible a book about the 14th century. <laughs> um, but it really is about the back and forth and we're always improving things and, and you know, I find it really fun to talk over plot points with Boyd. And I think in the past, it's, it, you know, in some of his solo novels and whatnot, it's been a, a lonelier process. So I think he enjoys having a sounding board and that kind of back and forth. Absolutely. And, and I assume you were doing a lot of this during the pandemic. So you, you also needed the, the benefit of technology too. Yeah, exactly. And, and the weird thing is that we started this the, the idea of this book in 2018 and we went to Europe in the beginning of 2019 we actually visited Notre Dame Cathedral which which serves as a setting in the book two months before the tragic fire that almost destroyed it and so we started writing this book long before the current pandemic and so the fact that our book takes place in a post-pandemic world doing during a a war in Europe is just a weird coincidence. Weird echoes. Yeah, but I think I think it kind of shows how things, even though it's 670 years later, um, our book takes place in 1351. Um, it, it's it's uh, sad that things don't really change that much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was thinking a lot about that during the beginning of the pandemic because you know, we had been writing this novel and, you know, I have done some academic work on the Black Plague. And it was amazing to me in those days in March, especially right when the pandemic started, that it was basically exactly the same as the medieval experience. We were all huddled in our houses. We were, were tracking the, the way that the plague was coming closer and closer and closer to our hometowns just like they did in the Middle Ages. And there was still nothing we could do except wait it out. And as you know, Kevin, the word quarantine comes from the medieval idea of 40 days, quaranta, that which the, the amount of days that ships had to stay at sea before the people could come off. And, and what did we all do? We did quaranta, you know, that's exactly what we we're trying to do. And so that kind of collapsing of the two time periods was really fascinating to me and the fear was real. And of course this pandemic was nothing compared to the Black Plague and what they went through psychologically. But you think about how much our society has been altered by the events of the past two years. It really helped inform our understanding of what our characters were going through. Yeah, it is, you know, very surreal when, because I've read, you know, a few uh, articles and things on, on previous plagues at different points in history, and you read some of the primary sources from those periods, and the things they're saying, you know, having lived this myself, it just, re oh, I, I get it, I get it. Exactly. It really is amazing how you know, and, and, and thank goodness now we can get the vaccines and we do have medical care and advanced hospitals to help save lives. But you can imagine what this pandemic would have been like had it happened in the 14th century. It could have been very similar because people didn't understand then that actually staying away from each other and how it was transmitted and they didn't have any kind of, um, you know, sophisticated care in hospitals in terms of ventilators and and all that kind of thing, it could have been almost exactly the same. Hey guys, I want to say thank you for being a listener of this podcast. I hope you're enjoying it and that you're learning a lot. I wanted to take a moment to tell you about a way that you can support the podcast through the show's Patreon. Over at patreon.com, you can support the show for as little as a dollar a month. You can contribute whatever you feel the show is worth. And supporters get some extra perks, such as bonus Q&A episodes with some of my guests, uh, the opportunities to submit listener questions, 
and then supporters get early access to all episodes uh, about a week before anybody else. So if you're interested in supporting the podcast, head over to patreon.com slash cmtu history. One way you can support the podcast that is absolutely free is you can like the show on whatever app you like to listen to podcasts on, uh, write a little review. Those things are immensely helpful in getting the show some exposure to new listeners. Uh, you can also follow the show on social media. I am on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. All of them are at CMTU History. And one new development with the podcast is that the show is now on YouTube. I know that some people like to listen to podcasts on YouTube. Maybe they have it up uh, in the background while they're at work at their desk. Uh, so I'm working on making that available. I have a YouTube channel, CMTU History. Look for Can't Make This Up. And then I'm working on getting the back catalog of episodes up on there. Please bear with me. It's a, a bit of a slow process, but I'm, I'm working on it. Uh, and then, of course, please subscribe to the show on YouTube. That's something I'm trying to really build up uh, as kind of the next phase of the podcast. All right. Thanks for listening, guys. Now back to our interview. Okay. So uh, historical fiction, uh, I'm a big fan of historical fiction. It can be a lot of fun. It can be informative. Uh, but I have noticed that sometimes historical fiction uh, can also fall into a trap of wanting to show how much research went into the book. There's a, there's a, there's a good balance there. How do you guys approach that balance? Well, I, I think just coming from a thriller novel background, I know what I like to read. And so what we strive to do is give a sense of place and time without bogging down the story. And there's definitely places that Beth will be able to tell you that I, I put in more research than was really necessary for the story. And, and she was very good about telling me, no, we don't need to know all that. This is, we, we need to move on and, and keep the story flowing. Um, and yeah, I think that's, I think because we do so much research, we want that to, we want to include all that because we've spent so much time doing it. But um, what, after you add it in, it's, it's much easier to strip it out and say, okay, this is enough to give, give the sense of, of what's going on in this time period without dwelling on it. Um, and so, yeah, we, it, it's a fine balance. I think a really good example of, of um, one way to handle it is that we had a scene near the beginning of the novel where our characters are going for the feast of the translation of the body of St. Thomas Beckett at Canterbury Cathedral. And um, we originally had like two paragraphs about the death of St. Thomas Beckett and why they were translating his body and why that was different than his death date and all this kind of thing. And it was exactly as you said, Kevin, like, Da, 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 da. And it's like, and the editor actually was the one. We had a, a fantastic editor, and she said, This totally stops the story. You've got to delete it. But we also felt like we had to get the, the reader to understand why Thomas Beckett was a big deal and why all these people would be there. Your average so, reader won't know that. Exactly, have no idea. So Boyd and I um, redid the scene, I think, in a really um, interesting way where we had the two main characters who were both interested in history themselves have a debate about the different primary sources about the death and um, the translation of the body so that it was through dialogue and it actually showed some of their, their characters because she wanted to argue one way and he was like, well, you're, I can't believe a woman is arguing, like <laughs> sort of like get some depth into him figuring out who this other character was and um, I think it, I think it ended up working really well, don't you, Boyd? Oh yeah, yeah. I think it, it's much more interesting if they're, and, and we get to to have them be uh, clever, have clever dialogue, hopefully, about this this incident. And and because it's such an interesting historical event where there are different different stories about what exactly happened. And so we could easily make that into 
a an argument between them about what really happened because i think as historians always have differing viewpoints about what exactly um, occurred in a historical event and so it made it a much more interesting discussion about it rather than just making it an info dump for the reader and i think that a lot of people don't don't really understand where history comes from they they're used to seeing it in their eighth grade you know history book but that is from primary sources in the middle ages and they don't always agree and and as boyd said i think it makes people understand like oh when you whenever you have an event nowadays you have instant social media from 50 different perspectives and people can see very different things but they don't think of that as something that's also true in the past and so I think it also helps people understand, sort of like make a connection with medieval history. And I think the other thing that's interesting about it is for, even though this takes place 670 years ago, that was a historical event for them because the, the murder of Thomas Beckett was over a hundred years before they were even born. And so for them, it's, it's something that they are looking about, about in the past, like as if we, debate things that happened during the Civil War. And it, it's it's a subtle thing that readers will resonate with, with their own experience. And yes, it'll hopefully and, humanize your characters. Right, right. And, and hopefully either people will be familiar with it, with Thomas Beckett while they're reading it, and it brings up things that they've thought about, or as Beth said, it introduces them to something they didn't, a fascinating historical event that that um, they didn't know about before makes them want to go learn more about it. Yeah, and as you've mentioned uh, a little bit earlier, the, your book can also be seen not just as entertainment uh, for reading, but also as an educational tool. Yes, yeah. It, it, first and foremost, for, for sure, we wanted to make this an entertaining story. The, mm -hmm. the educational aspect is, is certainly part of that, um, but that's that's more of a secondary aspect. And and one thing that that we did, Beth actually wrote an afterword at the end of the book that talks about what is real historically and and the very few things that we made up for the story. And so I think that will give all people also another way to look at the historical uh, events in in the book. And what Boyd and I spent a lot of time talking about was the fact that we do feel like our book is a bit different from what people tend to think of as historical fiction, in that when you think of sort of historical fiction, it's often a particular battle, or it's, a, you know, looking at a king, or sort of, you know, or even a mystery. But there's, uh, you know, the, there's not a lot of really good exact um sort of comparisons for our book because it really is primarily a thriller. It's a it's an action packed fast moving, you know, I think a lot of historical fiction as you said Kevin, there's like four pages about the description of a stirrup or whatever and that is not mm -hmm. our book. You know, it is much more it, it really is like, you know, a sort of, you know, Jack Reacher kind of thriller. It's just set in a different time period with those ki same kinds of details. It's just a time period most people are not as familiar with. And we're following, I think, in the tradition of the romances that were written at the time of our book, where there were knight errants going around helping people and fighting evil villains and having adventures in lands that were unfamiliar to them. And so we really are just you know, following in that tradition. Yeah, we're sort of reviving an old genre rather than inventing a new one. And as Boyd said, if, if anybody out there knows um, medieval romances, and that term just comes from the word roman, which means that it's in a romance language, um, it was always about like a knight errant who's going off on a quest and he often finds a woman who needs some kind of help. And um, what I think is really fun about our novel is that it, it's updated so that, you know, it doesn't quite go the, the way you think it's going to go. <laughs> and, and really that story is still, I mean, you've just described Star Wars. It's still yeah. with us. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's. Was, 
a knight. He had a sword. He was dressed all in white. You know, he was he was a modern knight just, you know, based in, uh, you know, a future time period. And fighting a, against a, the Black Knight in his suit of armor. And yeah. And so is this something that we can expect to uh, see becoming a series? Is this, is this installment number one? Yeah, we're already working on book two, even as we speak. Um, we would love for the series to take off and to be doing this for a very long time. That's sort of our dream. And I think one of the exciting things about it is even, you know, talking with our publisher, like we've got ideas for books five, six, seven. There's so much, there's so many places that they can go that have fabulous things. And one of the things that Boyd and I really make a point of in, in, in The Lawless Land and um, the next in the series is that the one of the reasons that we travel and go to these places is because so many of these places still exist and are super cool. And so, you know, we would love it for the series to take off and eventually for there to be tours in Europe where they retrace the steps of our characters because these places are just super interesting and they're still there. And so Boyd and I have made a point of like trying to find the coolest 14th century monuments that are still around to have them travel to so that, you know, people can look it up on the internet and be like, oh, what? I've never heard of Mont Saint-Michel. What's that? And then they look and they're like, yeah, that is super cool. And, and you don't, you didn't have to speculate on what, uh, you know, these sites would have looked like, or you can go to the actual site and offer a very authentic description. And they're oh, very, yeah. they, they, a lot of them have changed so little in the last 170 years that you can really, as you're walking around, you can imagine what it, life would have been like back then. Uh, well, Boyd, Beth, uh, this has been uh, really interesting. Uh, I can't wait to uh, uh, check out this book uh, when it when it releases and uh, maybe listen to it in audio. That's I got quite a bit of a commute, like apparently you do, Beth. So uh, I do a lot of audio books. Um, if people want to uh, pick up a copy of this, uh, could you tell us a little bit more about where they can get it when it comes out and how to uh, get in touch with you guys to follow your work? Yes, um, it comes out May 12th in the US and the UK. And uh, you can find me at boydmorrison.com. And uh, my, all my social media links are there and, and uh, links for where you can buy the book are there. And, um, and uh, we're both on social media. Um, uh, I'm either uh, Boyd Morrison on uh, Twitter and Facebook and uh, Boyd Morrison writer on Instagram and Beth. Yeah, so you can find me on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter at either Beth Morrison writer or Beth Morrison PhD. Um, and we are doing some really fun things on social media, putting on um, videos and whatnot. Boyd and I just went to jousting lessons recently. Um, which they actually put us up on horses with lances and let us go. So there's going to be some really fun things. Check it out. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'll be very interested to see who won the jousting tournament. <laughs> <laughs> we both won since we didn't fall off the horses. <laughs> well done. It, it's a little bit slow-mo jousting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> jousting 101. All right. Well, thank you both so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you. It's been great. Thanks for having us, Kevin. Hey, gang. I hope you enjoyed this conversation I had with Beth and Boyd. If you would like to pick up a copy of The Lawless Land, I have included a link for you down in the description of this episode in your podcast app. And then I hope you will join me again next time where I will be talking with Paul Craddock about his book Spare Parts on the History of Organ Transplants. Until then, see you next time.